to the point with Michael Williams. Weather forecasters, border patrol, airport screeners, air traffic controllers, all of that and more could be facing a furlough situation in the coming weeks and a direct impact for you. Good morning and welcome. The countdown is underway. If the Congress and President cannot agree on a deficit reduction plan, $85 billion in cuts across the board to domestic programs and defense will go into effect on Friday. Many are predicting a calamitous impact from the Pentagon to those domestic programs. What are the chance the sequestration cuts as they're known will happen? Can they be avoided? What's the impact for our area? Joining me to talk about that is U.S. Representative Lois Frankel from District 22, Democrat from West Palm Beach. In her first year in Congress, her first two months, welcome, first to, two months, yes. welcome to the you. broadcast. Thank you. Great to be here. It's been a whirlwind two months. Before yes. we jump into the tough issues, uh, talk about the first two months and, and your thumbnail review. Well, I say I'm in the honeymoon phase. <laughs> Uh, but it, it, it has been whirlwind. I, I'm, first of all, very surprised mm -hmm. but pleased uh, the quality of the freshman class. There's 80 of us, 49 Democrats, uh, the rest Republicans, very accomplished people. And I would say overwhelming number coming to Congress wanting to work together. Congresswoman, you said a honeymoon phase, but you've not <laughs> been given a lot of time no. for a honeymoon. I want to run some footage and talk over it. Uh, just this past week, you and Democratic House Leader Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of the House, if we can roll that tape, we're together at the American right. Association of University Women to talk about fairness and pay and work equality issues. It says something that someone, the most powerful woman on Capitol Hill, and one of the most po powerful politicians standing right next to you, yeah. it speaks to... Uh, your new impact in Congress, but a lot of people were asking, why isn't Congress on Capitol Hill working 24-7 right. to try and get a deal to avoid these cuts we talked about that we want to dig into now? $85 billion in cuts, and yet Congress right. has been on recess most of the last week. You go back on Monday. Well, just to let you know, uh, we asked the same question last week. Our leader, Pelosi, uh, called on the Speaker of the House to keep us in Congress, and uh, I have to say I agree. I love being here. and. We work, you know, we meet with constituents and so forth, but uh, we do have a looming, what they call, a, a, what's called a sequestration. Mm -hmm. Sounds bad, and it is bad, because it's a bunch of mindless cuts that will, could dramatically affect our economy. Let's talk about some of the cuts, mindless cuts, as, <clears throat> as you call them. What are the kind of impacts? We talked about it at the outset of the broadcast. What are the impacts you most worry about if these cuts go through? for your district, for our well, area? What, what's, I think what, what I'm most worried about is the cumulative impact. Now, I'm just going to talk about the next year. Sure. Because uh, it's that's 10 where years the worth of It's cuts. 10 years worth of cuts. So we're talking about one year. We're talking about in the state of Florida alone, 80,000 jobs that could be lost. 80,000 jobs. And when we have such a, you know, we're in an economy that's just starting to improve. Uh, here in Palm Beach County, Tourism is finally on its way back, having one of our best years, and now we're facing possible delays in flights, uh, long waits on lines, uh, slowdowns uh, by custom agents all, all right. through s s South Florida. Uh, so we'd be going in the wrong direction. Less help for people who count on a social safety oh, net. Federal. Have, right. And when you say 80,000 employees, you're talking not only about federal workers who oh, could yeah. be furloughed, but the ancillary jobs, secondary right. jobs that go away because they rely on the government. It's mostly secondary jobs sure. because it's a contract, uh, folks we have contracts sure. with. Uh, and obviously, yeah, it's, it's we call, you know, a, a, I won't call it a trickle-down effect. It's sort of like a domino effect. What about safety net services? Now, sequestration would not affect directly Medicare payments or Social Security, right. but when people go to... Uh, to a federal government office in need right. of help, in need of answers, they're going to be in longer right. lines and get less help. Or if you make a claim, and now it's going to take months and months mm -hmm. because someone's on a furlough or there are less personnel. The U.S. Army last week said 300,000 jobs could be impacted nationwide. Right. Again, secondary jobs that no longer could be there because of that. Given all of that, given right. all of your concerns about the very direct impact it could have for your constituents and everybody else in Congress saying the same thing, why are we at such a log jam in your mind? You've been there two months. You're sent there as one of the newcomers to find solutions. Frankly speaking, is there a solution to be found in a Congress that's so divided? Well, let me start by saying this. I have found that most of my colleagues overwhelmingly are very sincere. They are there to move the country forward. But there is a real political divide in terms of how, of how we do it. And myself, and I don't want to make this more partisan than it has to be, but uh, Democrats 
want a more balanced approach. Uh, we recognize and that define balanced approach. a balanced approach is a combination of revenues, closing tax loopholes uh, with, with cuts. Because we do over time have to make some cuts. But the worst time right now to take $80 billion out of the economy, which is what this sequester would do this year, uh, right now we need jobs because the more, the more people who are working, the more revenues that are coming in. And so for the Congress to take inaction in this case uh, sends us in the wrong direction. We're, then we're, we're losing jobs and we're getting further behind the curve. At the end of the day, Republicans have said no tax increases. Right. Now, Nancy Pelosi the other day when I talked to her said there may, may be some traction for, again, closing loopholes without right. tax increases. Republicans who control the House right. are saying no tax increases. Right. Is any deal going to fly if it includes anything uh, on, in tax increases? They certainly say not. Do you think tax loopholes being closed and raising revenue by broadening the base might work? Well, I guess I'm probably not the right person to speak to about that because I certainly would go for that. And I think that m many of us uh, are willing to even, you know, even go for some things that would not be number one on our on our list because Life. because you have to compromise. Listen, what's the biggest cut you're you're willing? What's the biggest thing you and oh. Democrats are willing to compromise? Well, on? I'm not gonna. I, you know, you, you don't start in a position of compromise other than to say, you know, let me see what's put on the table, what's brought to us, and sometimes you vote. Uh, you know, you want to move the country forward, and so you vote sometimes saying it's not the the best deal, but it's the best deal we can get. Republicans say this, listen, we don't need any more taxes, we have a spending issue. We right. need to tackle yeah. long-term entitlements. Everybody yes. agrees Social Security, Medicare are the long-term drivers of debt. Will Democrats budge on that? Uh, certainly in a week you're not going to solve that, but are you all willing to begin to move forward on substantial changes to the way you index cost or how people who perhaps are more well-to-do at retirement uh, get their benefits, uh, perhaps pay a higher amount or pay more mm -hmm. to have those benefits. What are you all as Democrats willing to do to rein in entitlement growth? Well, let me just p ver ver take your assumption mm -hmm. for a Republican second. Republican assumption. Your, when I your assumption. <laughs> Probably the, the biggest driver in terms of our long-term deficit or debt is the cost of health care. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, Medicare or Social Security per se, but it is the cost of, of health care. And so to me, the issue is tackling that, and, and uh, the Affordable Health Care Act does that. Uh, we, it hasn't been implemented yet, but there are a lot of strategies to keep people out of hospitals, more efficient delivery of, of health care, go after fraud, waste, and abuse. And we also need to continue to invest in research and development. I mean, this sequester is going to cut uh, uh, billions of dollars from, from research and development where Somebody, if someone at Scripps right now could find the cure for the prevention of Alzheimer's, what a difference that would make in the cost of health care. Your mind, I know you're a freshman on the Hill. You're just right. getting settled into your <laughs> office. Despite you saying it, you didn't really have much of a honeymoon. None of you did. Do you think a deal is going to get done, or do you think by March 1st we're going to see these cuts go into effect? Well, I'm an eternal optimist, and I just can't fathom that rational, rational people will not come to some kind of, even if it's a temporary fix. Now, maybe it won't be March 1st, maybe it'll be March 15th. I'm not sure how mm -hmm. f far into the crisis uh, folks want to get. But if, if people are rational, uh, it, it's something that's got to give. How much are your constituents uh, ringing, calling, Facebooking you and telling you about their concerns? And do you think people really understand the real world Main right. Street impact of this enough and that come March 1st uh, may be in for a big surprise. Well, listen, I don't want everybody to run and hide in, in a bunker right, <laughs> right now. Right. And probably on March 1st and March 2nd, life is right. going to go right. on. No but, one's going to see that. But sometime after, right. sometime in but the it, spring. At, at some point in time, if the Congress does not act appropriately, yes, you're going to start to see the longer lines at the airports. Uh, you're going you're to you're go and make a claim for Social Security. It's not going to get processed in a, in a timely manner. Uh, maybe you're going to... Uh, some of the uh, uh, jurisdictions are going to, cities are going to have to let go some first, some firefighters. I mean, you're going to see an impact that if we don't do anything, at the end of the year, they're going to probably about 80,000 people in, in the state of Florida who become unemployed. If freshman Congresswoman Lois Frankel was the one writing the plan, right. 
what would it look like to break the loggerhead here and specifically what would it look like you've talked about taxes right. but what would it look like in terms of what democrats be willing to give up well, I think both the president, the Senate Democrats, even House Democrats have suggested a, a more balanced approach. Listen, I'm not going to try to tackle the whole sure. ten, 10 years, but I think for now, to get all, out of this bind, that we should go forward with at least uh, a, a budget for a year that's uh, going to close some of the tax loopholes. And maybe you, instead of $80 billion in cuts, we go for half. You're talking tax loopholes, but you haven't really said anything about where Democrats are beginning to be willing to move on entitlements. Even the president and State of the Union said we need to have, quote, modest reform. Right. I don't think we're going to get that kind of deal in the next week or two. And so uh, I think we need to give ourselves some breathing room. But I think something that's very important is that there has at some point be stability because you can't have businesses, you can't have hospitals uh, or airports all waiting for the shoe to drop. Uh, they have to know that, look, this is going to be what I can rely on for my resources for a certain period of time. At the end of the day, and, and you're quite right, talking well beyond March 1st, because right. we have a long-term right. issue we're dealing with. But even beyond March 1st, we'll see what happens then. Right. Will the balanced approach ultimately mean Republicans, and you've indicated this, right. having to give on taxes, but right. Democrats having to give and say we've got to look at different ways to rein in the cost of entitlements. You've talked about health care. Right. Will Democrats have to give on that summit, and are you willing to acknowledge that? Well, I use the word give. I think, I think that most of us are willing to look at all kinds of ideas, uh, but I will say this. I don't think the best idea is to shift the burden of the deficit on people when they are oldest and sickest. So, uh, you know, I'm interested in protecting Medicare and Social Security, uh, but certainly uh, there are many, many strategies that we can use to try to uh, keep the growth of health care down. Congresswoman Lois Frankel, when we come back from a break, we're going to talk about gun control, another major issue on Capitol Hill, one that you've uh, dove right into in terms of wanting to help impact legislation. We'll be back in just a moment. When Lois Frankel was running for Congress, guns were not a major issue until Newtown. Now that she's in office, she's made it one of her top priorities. Welcome back. The first legislation you introduced deals with regulating guns. You're a member of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. What type of legislation do you think has any chance of passing on Capitol Hill? And I, I saw your eyebrows right. go up a little bit because it's tough. Republicans, right. Democrats warring on this one as well. What's the most reasonable thing we might expect could right. see passage? Well, let me just say, we, we have to do something. And the public wants us to do something. The overwhelming majority of Americans want us to do something. Uh, even the majority of NRA members want us to pass background checks. Uh, right now, I think 40 percent of, of the guns that are sold are sold to people who don't go through a background check. So I think, I think that will pass. Universal background checks. Yes. You think that has a chance. No more go going to a gun show or doing any right. kind of sale without a background check. That's right. Assault weapons ban, any real chance of passage? You know, I, th I know a, a lot of us are going to give that our, uh, a try, and uh, we'll see where that goes. I had the sheriff of Palm Beach County in about a month and a half ago who said, we need an assault weapons ban. We don't need that kind of firepower on the street right. that endangers the citizenry and right. law enforcement. Had the sheriff of Martin County in saying, didn't think it was a practical measure right. work. Two learned men who deal with it every day, different sides of the issue. How do you make the case for an assault weapons ban? personally? Well, you know, here's what I say. First of all, there's enough legal weapons out there for somebody to protect themselves in their home or go out and go to a hunt or go to a lot of people use guns for recreation illegally. Um, you don't need to have an assault weapon and you don't need these high capacity magazines which allow someone to uh, kill dozens of people in, in a few seconds. There's some understanding or at least a sentiment that there might be room for a cap on the size of magazines. Do you think that has a chance on, on the Hill? That, uh, that you piece know, of the it, legislation? It, it possibly does. But you know, keep in mind also, Michael, that, that there's, still, there's still so many that are out there mm -hmm. now. Um, and so there are, there, are a lot of, and there are other strategies that we have to use, whether it's not just mental health, working with our kids, uh, educating folks, uh, there's a lot to do in this issue. I want to play a comment that reflects the sentiment of, of many gun owners and then okay. have you respond. Let's listen. What happened 
in Newtown, Connecticut is, is, is beyond horrible, and anybody is going to agree to that. But do we want to punish, you know, I mean, there's 300 million weapons in America. We're going to punish everybody. By the way, Congresswoman, you had a family from Newtown with you, State yes. of the Union. You were talking to me about that in right. the break. You heard that gentleman's sentiment. Newtown, Connecticut, horrible, of course, beyond description. What do you say to his comment, though? What could be a worse punishment for someone than to lose a child like the, the, the families in Newtown did? Just One of the families that right. was with you? Yes, I, I had a, a family who came as my guest uh, for this State of the Union. And, you know, I listened to their story and the story of quite a few other families who were up in Capitol Hill. They, they, were, they had lost loved ones to gun violence. That's, that, to me, is real punishment. His argument is, but gun owners say to you, you were at a gun roundtable. You said you had a better understanding right. of the resistance to the assault weapons ban or high capacity magazines. Since you have a better understanding of that, what now is your argument to people say, wait, I, I'm law abiding. I, right. I'm, I'm allowed to have my guns. Right. The Second Amendment allows me to have that. How do you now tweak your argument having heard this at well, roundtables? There are a lot, of, a lot of guns out there, rifles that they can still and still would be able to legally own. But even, even the most gun owners do agree that we should have the background checks. And I really think that, that even most gun owners believe that, listen, you don't, they don't need an assault weapon to defend themselves in their home or to go out to hunt, hunt deer. Have uh, you had gun owners come up to you privately and say, listen, uh, privately I feel that way? Absolutely. And, most and, most that I've met. And do they say they don't want to say that publicly? And if so, why? I think they, I think, uh, you know, I think the public polling shows that they do feel that way. So, you know, I, I think the, gov the, the, the public, the citizens that we represent are far ahead of the Congress on this issue. Let me ask you, you talked earlier about a very important component here. I know your legislation would also look at mental health training for teachers, first right. responders. Right. Do you think you're going to be able to see that advanced in any kind of bill? Because a lot of people have right. said, aside from the physical weapons, right. the exactly. mental health issue in this country is right. a crisis. Indeed, the two sheriffs right. I mentioned, Sheriff yeah. Snyder and Sheriff Bradshaw, both agreed mental health issues, being able to identify early right. on that problem person is an enormous issue. And most of it, they said, is being dealt with in our jails. How do we deal with it? Well, I hope that'll be part of the package. At first, I just want to say, on, on behalf of the mental health professionals, although I'm not one, is that most folks with mental health issues are not, are not uh, apt to use a gun. So I don't want it sure. connected that way. Sure. With that said, uh, there's no question that more resources are needed. And uh, one of the bills that I signed on would, would be training for certain kinds of professionals that would allow them to identify uh, folks who might be apt to go out and uh, yeah, get a gun and, 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 and commit a violent act. It'll be an interesting year on so many levels. Interesting probably doesn't begin to describe it. I'd like you to have a closing comment two months in now to your first term in the United States Congress. And I think if there's one final question, people really do worry that we no longer have a Congress that can work together and yeah. get anything done. We're about to find out how true or wrong they are. Your final thoughts as you head back to the Hill. Well, let me tell you about Valentine's Day. On, on Valentine's Day, uh, we had uh, Republicans and Democrats invite each other for dinner. I went to a small dinner, and I was very, very pleasantly surprised because I sat around a table. There was maybe about 20 of us, mm. different parts of the country, half Republican, half Democrats. And every single one of us, uh, even though uh, philosophically we were different on, in some areas, we wanted to find ways to work together. I really do believe that spirit is somehow there and ready to burst out. I don't know how it will happen. I hope it does happen. I'm an optimist. I've come with that attitude. I think the American people want us to work together. And uh, I know I'm going to give it my best try. Heading back to Capitol Hill for a very bus busy week uh, on your honeymoon, as you call it. Yes. <laughs> I don't think you've ever been so busy <laughs> in your life. Thank you so much for being with us, Congresswoman Thanks. Lois Frankel, and for talking to your constituents here on To The Point. We appreciate you being and We know you've got to get back up north. And you were saying in the break, getting used to the cold weather has yes. probably been right. the biggest challenge. Yes. Okay. Thank you much. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Thanks again for spending time with us, Congresswoman Frankel. We appreciate it so much. We'll be following what's going on in Congress, and I'm sure <laughs> be heading to the Hill soon enough to catch up with you there. So we thank you at home, of course, for spending time with us on today's To The Point. As always, if you'd like to send us a comment about today's broadcast, go to WPTV.com and click on our political link. As always, wishing you and yours a great day. 
and a great week.